The world has changed. Health is our most precious asset. This pandemic has highlighted the need of technology for humanity to survive. Billions of data are generated. This is the key to find cures for all diseases. There is no easy way for doctors to use it. Sharing medical data is challenging. We always fear an intruder could come in and destroy everything. But now, Galleon reveals the power of a new innovation, blockchain. Innovators around the world can fight together, eradicate cancer, prevent pandemics, cure obesity and diabetes, stop orphan diseases. There is no limit to human progress. Galeon is connecting blockchain to the medical knowledge, creating a new world where hospitals and patients are connected together in a secure and transparent way. Thanks to blockchain, patients have the control of their own data. They can choose to share it in a secure way for the good of humanity. It's time to be part of this new revolution. Join us now. Many of you are wondering why my skin looks so good right now. And I can tell you the answer. I've been using products made by Olive and M. Olive and M are an incredible olive oil based skin company and their products contain natural plant-based ingredients that were chosen for a specific reason, to make your skin look better. Olive oil penetrates your skin quickly and easily, healing it at its deepest level. Olives are a powerful antioxidant and they protect and repair against damaging free radicals. Olives stimulate skin regeneration, allowing your skin to look refreshed on a daily basis. And olive oil balances skin's own oil production, naturally reducing oily spots. I cannot tell you how much my skin has improved since I started using Olive and M's products. Go to oliveandm.com. Before this podcast begins, I want to recommend a quite extraordinary book called Shaggy Dog Memoirs, which came out on the 30th of November. It's written by John Lewis, who Debs and I had the privilege of meeting actually on a flight in America, and we got talking to him about his fascinating life. John has spent his whole life doing incredible things. He's had a long and glittering career, but his passion for the care and training of dogs is what made an impression on us and what he's written this book about. So after he was in the army and then subsequently traveled to places like Yemen, Norway, Canada, John began to focus on his love for dogs and his natural ability to train them to the best of their abilities. And this book explores this work and it's so funny and it illustrates his commitment to animals, to dogs, in a way that is going to resonate with any of you who own a dog. This book is absolutely wonderful. I couldn't recommend it more highly. Shaggy Dog Memoirs is available on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, basically all good bookstores. Google it, Shaggy Dog Memoirs by John Lewis. This is going to be one of the books of 2024 and You've got to read it. Evan, Seth, thank you so much for coming on the Greatest Music of All Time podcast. Uh, it's a real honor to have you both on and there's so much to talk about, but I just wanted to begin as it's the Greatest Music of All Time podcast by asking you, what's your relationship with music and, and you know how did your relationship with music start? Uh, it was one of the first things we heavily connected on. Yeah, we would hang out at a record store. A and B Sound. A and B Sound in Vancouver. And uh, look yeah. At, look at DVDs we couldn't afford because they were... 12 bucks each. Yeah. Was a and, lot. and yeah, we'd, uh, yeah, we just look at, uh, yeah, I remember we'd buy CDs and look at CDs and, and just flip through countless CDs. And that's how we would just, they had a thing. You could listen to the songs. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. They would open it for you. And, uh, yeah. And then LimeWire came out when we were like around. And, and then Napster came out. Napster. Even yeah. And 
yeah, so like our ability to download whatever song we wanted and make like mix tapes and mix CDs and stuff. And, and it was it was only, it was also the first time you'd find like weird alts and like B sides and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, as opposed to just the main version that was pumped out. Yeah, yeah, that um, that whole era of uh, LimeWire and uh, Napster, Kazar, all of those um, P 2 P platforms. That was kind of almost the start of the Spotify thing of for you know sure. getting t for ten bucks a month get any song that you want. It's the beginning of the end of uh, the music industry. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> where the decline began. Yeah, and, and um, when it when it comes to that side of uh, things, you know the the fact that you can listen to whatever you want now. Um, do you find that somewhat overwhelming? Extremely, extremely. It, overwhelming. it is overwhelming. Yeah, I find myself going back to the same music a lot, which I, I try. I'll have like a. I'll be like, today I will expand my horizons, and then I'm like, no, I'm going to listen to Sam Cooke again. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to branch out sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> my phone feeds me some random cool stuff, but I mostly go. To it's ju it's just difficult to retain it in the same way. You can listen to something very cool or through a Spotify playlist, and then forget what the song was or whatever. Sometimes you'll hear a song. I mean, maybe it's because like like that uh, Doja Cat song that samples "Walk On By." Like, I think maybe because it has a sample to a song I know and love already i instantly was like oh this song's great like i i, I know this song immediately you know what i mean it's an amazing song but mm. like sometimes yeah i find like that's that's a way i'll gravitate to new music is if it samples an old song that i like <laughs> yeah no, i think one of the like true first super bonding things for us was we wanted to create the ultimate triple rock cd set or no it was cassettes yeah or was it eh. but uh yeah and we thought we'd created like the greatest most interesting cd ever and it was kind of just the best of rock and roll it was nothing super innovative. But. It was something that I'm sure every like stone twelve year old yeah. made. So one point, yeah. we, we thought we were like we've done. It. We were like we did it. This what if it. it went from Led Zeppelin into Pink Floyd? Oh. <laughs> and uh, on the Houseplant website, there's this description of that relationship that you both had uh, with music and making those mixtapes. And one thing that was brilliant about that is that it did describe very well the sort of pre the age of abundance that we live in yeah we would sit now. there yeah we you'd, you'd sit with a tape player next to the radio and you would wait till you heard a song that you liked and record it very quickly and usually miss the first like five or ten or, seconds or, of it or, maybe. or you get it but it has a little bit of an ad for yeah it had a little bit of an ad before yeah if you were overshooting it i would call and request songs on the radio so i could tape them and put them on my mixtapes as well yeah we would yeah it was it was a nightmare and and yeah so this idea of actually like having access to whatever song you want whenever you want it honestly like i remember like That's sitting there like i remember we, we downloaded magic carpet ride by uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Was, like, the first <laughs> we were like that song rocks Let's listen we to found that. the coolest song yeah we found the coolest song <laughs> but it was hard to get i didn't have a steppenwolf uh, record you know what i mean yeah yeah and it was expensive yeah i mean and and in the age of streaming how has your relationship with music changed because obviously you know, House Houseplant Vinyl Volume Three has just come out. You're passionate about vinyl, and you you even collaborated on that record player. Yeah. So so, do you listen to most of your music on vinyl, or do, or do you stream? What, what's that? What's we that kind of relationship? We do listen like? to most of our music. Yeah, on we vinyl. do. Yeah. In our office, right behind our desk, we have a vinyl uh, player, and we kind of just go through that. Yeah, it's just the unlimited options. It's a, it causes anxiety. It's too much. Yeah, it's true. I, I like just putting something on and it and it and and knowing what you know it doing its thing in some ways. You know, just committing. And yeah, exactly. Mm. You're kind of just committing to something, and uh, I like how it sounds. I think like uh, uh, yeah, I think like the whole. It, it's a little more deliberate, I think, which is nice. But yeah, this idea of kind of combining our love of mixtapes, which is like one of the first things that we bonded over with our love of vinyl, which is like one of the things that, yeah, we like now currently spend, you know, is the way we listen to most music, like, and going to record stores is something that we still love and love. Our office used to be right next to Amoeba. We would go there all the time instead of writing. And so, <laughs> um, yeah, this idea of like making like a mixtape in vinyl form was really, um, it was really cool and exciting. And what's funny is, yeah, like I've, it's like, oh, 
Ah. That's good, though. Hold that thought. I was running out of steam anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the songs that you've chosen for, um, for this episode, how, how would you kind of characterize them? Are they like your absolute favorites of all time or just things that have had a We were just effect? saying it's hard to pick your favorite songs of all time. There's yeah, yeah. five of them. Like if I had to pick like my hundred <laughs> favorite songs of all time, I could probably do that. And people, when we make movies, you know, we make, people are always like, what's your favorite movie? And it's like, it's impossible. And even yeah, like, what's yeah. your top five favorite movies? Like, so I would say... These are the five songs that I feel comfortable right now putting forward <laughs> as five songs that are among my fa- I'd say these are among my favorite songs. I can't definitively say that I only have five favorite songs. But these are probably ones I go back to a lot. Yeah, I chose ones I go back to a lot. And I maybe, actually let like my phone tell one. me. I have like a most played songs thing on my iPhone. And so I'm looking at what I actually just listen to the most. So it's partially being fed to me by my own algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> well, because a lot of people, a lot of guests are kind of, you know, they say that. And it is understandable that just committing to five songs over and above. So yeah. I, I wanted to sort of clarify that first. But then... You know, in terms of what you've chosen, are any of those tracks from that age when you were making those cassette mixtapes and, oh, and they've stayed oh, yeah. with you? Oh, for sure. Um, I wonder if we have any of the same song. We haven't, we haven't shared our songs with each we're gonna other. Find so. out. <laughs> we're going to find out. Okay, well, well we've got to have... Uh, we'll, we'll go in turns uh, in terms of the five, uh, okay. so, song at a time. So, uh, Evan, what's your, your first choice? Head Like a Hole by Nine Inch Nails. Nice. Oh, that's one of mine. I like that one. I've just listened to that song so many times. It's just, it's when you need that song, it's the right one. We just worked with Trent Reznor, so it, I also grew Did up. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he and Atticus Ross did the score for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, <laughs> um, the animated movie wow. we just made. And uh, yeah, I would wear a Nine Inch Nails like, shirt to high school like every yeah, day. And like yeah. when, when asked what the best concert of my life is, without a doubt, Nine Inch Nails. Like, oh, yeah. In Vancouver? That was the greatest thing. That was thing the I've craziest thing I've ever, ever seen. What, what era was that that you saw? It was actually like in 2000. 13 or 14 or yeah, something like that like it was not it was like 10 years ago so it was like not when we were in high school but it was still like unbelievable it was such a cool show yeah. i think that's also one of the reasons like i always wanted to see them i could never get yeah. there I never had the money it was never in town and then it finally happened and it took that long but oh best it didn't disappoint head, head like a hole was from uh pretty hate machine i think exactly. like like yeah everything that he's done has just been so different. Have you followed him throughout? And you know, did you like the downward spiral and all that stuff? Oh yeah, and, yeah. Oh, every, yeah. I like it record. all. I like it all. Well, some is, every now and then one's a little too intense. <laughs> <laughs> but generally speaking, yeah, it just it's a, it's a mood I'm in every now and then, and it's just the greatest. Yeah. And and when you worked on the movie um, with Trent and Atticus Ross, um, did did you get to uh, to meet him? And being a fan, did you were you? intimidated at all or, or starstruck Seth dealt with it all and I've still not met him and I don't want to yeah I I, <laughs> I want to meet him I want him to remain <laughs> I, yeah, I went and met with him with uh, Jeff Rowe who directed the film and we kind of pitched ourselves in the movie to them and uh, we were yeah like not honestly I came out of that meeting being like I I don't think they're gonna say yes. Like, and then literally, like as we were walking to the car, they texted him was like, "We're in, let's do it." <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, wow. but it was, yeah, they really got it, and they 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 got what we were trying to do. They seemed to really, you know, our pitch was like a lot of the look of the movie is like as though high school kids kind of like drew it, like it has like a sketchbook feel to it. So our musical pitch was like. What if it sounded kind of like like the band you had in high school, like like a garage band almost, like not like perfect. And we talked about video game music a lot and stuff like that. And so like the result almost feels like a weird mix of like video game music and like a bunch of kids just like thrashing in their garage in in high school. And it's and it's amazing. And then there's just some straight up like incredible industrial yeah. intensity uh, yeah. to it. And like it kind of has everything. They They did such a good job. Yeah. Did, does he still tours? Doesn't he amidst yep. all the because um, the stop. the movie um, the scores yeah the scores are unbelievable oh yeah they they've won several Oscars the social net was the a couple social years network ago he was up against yeah, yeah. himself for the Oscar they, they had two <laughs> nominated scores two I think it was up and uh, or not up it no, was Soul and uh, oh yeah they did Soul yeah and then another one that was very different it was like a Fincher it was like Soul and Mank I think Soul and Mank were up against each other for best Soul score really and, and and they did both of them yeah well it's uh, yeah I mean well I mean the amount of people who you've worked with of that caliber 
must be a lot but i mean as somebody who was listened to all those nine inch nails records uh, yeah when you grow up like loving people it's to it's it's always it's a different always thing a little different yeah <laughs> and so what song one for you seth song one for me is ebony eyes by stevie wonder i did not see that yeah <laughs> is, that, that, is that from songs songs in the key of life yeah <laughs> uh it is from songs in the key of life it's uh it's i don't know if it's a popular song it's just a song that i always really gravitate to it's a good and song it's in a really 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 good song it's kind of plucky it's upbeat um i love stevie wonder and i uh, uh you know what's funny is like there was this like skate video we would watch when we were kids called secondhand smoke mm. and it was like the first time none of the music and it was licensed uh but it was it was all like my first time hearing like like stevie wonder was in it like sign sealed delivered was on it and uh this guy casual from the hieroglyphics i never heard the hieroglyphics oh, yeah, before yeah, was yeah. on it remember and like I over do. the hills and far away was on it and uh dream on by aerosmith was on it and it was like my first time hearing any of these songs i was like 12 years old or something like that and i really think like that skate video like directly <laughs> informed my sense of music yeah, for the Steve rest of my life snowboarding videos yeah for yeah, sure probably. and 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 yeah and it had stevie wonder on it. and i remember i like love stevie wonder and uh but ebony eyes for whatever reason is a song i listen to like i like almost a day doesn't go by when i for some reason that song doesn't come on <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing song it's, it's a great song it's it's <laughs> such an incredible album in general yes and and so well with the, with the with the houseplant uh vinyl collections the volumes yeah um they're split because i'm trying to work out your two selections so far like if they were to be included on would a they be mixtape. sativa indicas or hybrids yeah i definitely uh, think nine is uh, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely on the sativa side with that one I think Ebony Eyes would be hybrid. Probably yeah. Sativa. I think it'd be Sativa. It's pretty uh, upbeat song. It, it could go either way. It's a pretty upbeat song. Yeah, we, we have a lot of debate. They're, they're, they, we, we get into very big arguments. Yeah, we like over. curate like 100 songs, then we all pick our favorites, and then we kind of divide them. Which yeah. category. And the, the, the Sativa hybrid argument is a. Because there's some yes. seriously, uh, I mean, the the track listing and uh, and the music in general, there's some obscure stuff oh, on yes. there. Very obscure uh, stuff. And, <laughs> and it is. It is brilliant. I mean, I thought it, I, I knew it would be good because I, you know, I know that you put a lot of effort into everything that you do with, with Houseplant. But so that process is pe it's people researching, then sending you the tracks. Yeah, well, it's a then, big mix. It's us it's sending mix, yeah. them hundreds of songs and submitting and, and seeing if they're clearable for use. And then it's also people sending us songs. We have other people who just start adding songs they like. Some of the songs are songs that we've never heard before. Yeah, and which like, is the best when like we find a song in the process. Have, yeah. you, have you ever had any sort of, uh, you know, disagreement over a track has one of you said i really like this one and the other one come back and gone it's a this is crap the <laughs> argument in general <laughs> then we'll bring someone else in and then kind of try to tie yeah. break and see where it goes. we have had this we've we have very much had disagreements over it. but there's had, nothing hey, on hey, any hey, of the vinyls hey, that one hey, of us hey, dislikes yeah, yeah no you can veto i think yeah we, we ultimately give away give people yeah no we don't want anything out there that that either of us hates on the thing. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. We make a lot of decisions together in life, so we're used to it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I mean, obviously a lot of people are going to know all the context behind your, your friendship and your collaboration, uh, but just to hear it, uh, you know, in your in your own words, when, when did you meet? Was it in high school? We met in bar mitzvah class. Yeah, bar mitzvah we were class. 12 years old, so before high school. Um, and then we went to the same high school together. And... Then we also went to high school together, but we uh, knew each other before that. Yeah, and then in, in high school, we just hung out with each other, and a man named Sammy Fogel, all day, every day, for pretty much the first two years of high school. And we were obsessed with movies, and I was, I'd started to do stand-up comedy around then, and Evan wrote short stories and stuff like that, and one day we were like, uh, like let's try to write a movie together, basically, um, about the stuff happening to us in high school. Um, and it was super bad, and it wasn't made till. I mean, we were, we were still. Pretty, I think we were twenty three when they when they finally made it. So, so we weren't. Uh, yeah, we were pretty. Yeah, it took around ten years, but uh, yeah. So we started writing that throughout high school, and um, in the meantime, I left high school and moved to L A. and I was on a show called Freaks and Geeks, and another show. And we pretty much player. immediately started talking about the soundtrack. Like we were constantly like, this song could go yeah, here. This song could go. Here. Oh yeah, I literally remember writing in like. Like John Lee Hook, like like a lot of like the John Lee Hooker's on my list. Yeah, oh no, hey, there you go. <laughs> I remember like we would because we were obsessed with Quentin Tarantino. Like 
like obsessed with him, you know? And like I had like a pulp fiction poster on my wall, like like it was like, kind of my best possession as a child, my pulp fiction poster. Yeah, and so I like, was like I'm a man now. Yeah, and like and he really I mean, it like I I, I didn't know a lot of it was very like Scorsese and yeah, at the time because I hadn't seen a lot of those movies yet, but at the time his like use his like unabashed kind of use of like music and in cinema and songs and time sequences into songs was something that like really opened our minds and really made us be like, yeah, like we like that. We want to do that in in our movies, you know? Yeah, the soundtracks. I mean, it's difficult to think of somebody who uses music in a Scorsese too. I mean, I mean Scorsese as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah, the both of them. And and and, and yeah, and it, obviously it's one's very inspired by the other, but it's something that we always look to and it's like yeah, just kind of like this like unabashed use of like songs in a way that like you're editing the scenes around them and all that, right? And in in um, you know, we need to move on to song 2, but just on on the subject of of super bad uh, I read, and I just wanted to know whether it's true, because you can't believe half of the stuff that you read these days, uh, that, you know, at a certain point, you thought, oh, have American Pie, uh, you know, beaten us, quote unquote, to this to this idea or, or whatever? You know, how much did the, did the, yeah. did the film change over, over 10 years? I think it just kind of got more realistic over time. Like the first edition of it, or edition draft, was like a little broader, but then like as we thought the world was kind of getting less broad. And as we went through more of high school, it started to reflect reality more and more. Yeah. We, we were in grade eight projecting what was happening in grade 12. Yeah. And I think also like, yeah, like, so yeah, like because we were writing a movie that was fundamentally about like young guys trying to have sex and then American Pie came out, we were like, there was a moment where it was like, oh no, but also it did so well that it was also like encouraging in some ways. And it was also so yeah. different. And I actually... It's funny, like now I look at Super Bad, and it almost seems like a reaction to movies like an American, like American Pie, like like as they're very different. They're yeah. very different. Yeah, and, like and we laughed very hard when we saw that movie when we were kids, but uh, but it's just a totally different. It's thing. totally different. I think it doesn't. It's not as rooted in like insecurity and self loathing <laughs> as 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 our work tends to be. It's you a know? more confident version of exactly, uh, high and like we and we were really into like <laughs> movies like Swingers and stuff like that. So like to us like. That was always how we pictured Superbad was kind of like a much more grounded version of of high school, you know, and, and like what it was more like to us, right? Yeah. Yeah, not because of any genius strategy. We just were like, what do we know? And that was it. Yeah, and that movie's so big. It was like, yeah, it's like, you know, the set pieces are like, they're broadcasting their their, their <laughs> like sexual escapades over the internet. And like to us, it was just like, what if they're trying to buy beer? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're brilliant in the, in their own ways, but I suppose Superbad has become more like revered and, and and it's kind of held up better. Whereas American Pie, people kind of look back on it with a with a slight like almost embarrassment. I don't know people who grew, <laughs> people who grew up with it yeah, like it was, sometimes. It was of its time. Like it was of its time, movies, like everything. Like, it was of its time. Yeah, and you never know what's going to hold up. And we've made plenty of stuff that doesn't. But Superbad seems to have prevailed in some way as far as like resonating with. A younger generation i see a lot of young kids in mclovin t-shirts and i meet a lot of 18 year olds who still who like super bad and it's like it's like the high school movie they relate to yeah high school or f yeah. will forever be embarrassing and exactly yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's what the movie is that's what we got <laughs> well uh sorry for digressing on that but you know no, i just have, have to ask uh, but we're now on song two for you evan uh parliament uh funkadelic maggot brain Oh, uh, see, I was, you know, I, 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 that was like for sure on my, you know, I, but I'm going to move away from it if that's. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it goes on forever. It's just got the greatest guitar ever. It's such, such a good song. It's so good. I just love Fun it so much. Fun fact about Superbad is. Oh, yeah. Bootsy Collins plays the score. For super bad, like it's a funk score, and there's like a funk bass, and that is Bootsy Collins uh, from Funkadelic playing the actual score of Super Bad, which most people don't know. How and, did that come about? And there's moments where you hear him go like, "Yeah, McLovin," like <laughs> like he's like vocalizing throughout it as well, and it's in the movie. And and but it, it, yeah, like literally, Funkadelic and Bootsy Collins are like part of that, like are playing the score of the movie. Yeah. It was just an idea. It just came together. Our the title kind of like dictated the musical tone to us as soon as we had super bad 
then it was like, oh, maybe we should kind of lean into this funk kind of... Yeah, and Greg, the director, is like a huge music fan, Greg Matola, and he really leaned into it. We hired Lyle Workman, did the score, and it was a funk score, and he, I remember he came to us, and he was like, what if we get actual, like, great funk musicians to play the score? Yeah, we thought that was impossible, and he was like... I'm going to try. And it just yeah, all came and together. Like, cut to us, like, sitting in a room with Bootsy Collins. <laughs> it like, was super bad on a screen as he's, like... He was wearing a Wolverine shirt. Oh, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> like, giant platform shoes, like a top hat. It and he was, was very nice. nice. Oh, yeah, it was great. It was really, really amazing. Was incredible. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so you did get to meet him and, and everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Like days with him, yeah. It, it took a few days to do the score. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. I can't believe I never knew that. That it's is, really something very few people I guess know. it wasn't publicized. Yeah, it's funny. It's, and you yeah. wouldn't think it. That's why it's so like real sounding. <laughs> and, there, and there is a song, I believe it's titled Sleeping Bags from the movie. And it is one of my favorite songs too. Like I genuinely love it. One of my friends got married to it. That's a, that's a good one from the Superbad album. Yeah, I mean, to, to have had someone like that working on a movie that you'd been writing since you were, was it 13 years old? Yeah. But, um, and legit, a guy we listened to while writing. It was, it was, it was surreal. Oh yeah, we were like obsessed with Funkadelic. Like, it's actually, I think, from might have been from one of those. It might have been from American Pie. Actually, is like give up the funk is in it. I think uh, one of those maybe, movies. Yeah. And like we became obsessed with like Flashlight, Give Up the Funk, and all these like Funkadelic songs, you know, Parliament songs. And so yeah, it was like for sure what we listened to as we were writing the movie a lot. A gate, a gateway to uh, Parliament and uh, Funkadelic. For some people, has been um, Snoop Dogg sampling. Um, the dog. Uh, do, you know what was PCU? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. In the yeah, movie yeah. PCU, which is a yeah. movie that like weirdly we were obsessed with, and is not a very we're popular not we're not movie. alone. There are I just... don't know. It's not John Favreau's in it. it, it Jeremy, Jeremy Piven, Piven is the star of it. A very bald <laughs> Jeremy Piven playing a college student, um, and it's like we were obsessed with this movie, and and it's about like a frat in in in, in a in a university, and like part of the third act is they get Funkadelic to perform at their frat house. So it has like. Funk yeah, we were like, this is yeah. a dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> They're living the dream. It's so funny. Forgot about that till just right now. <laughs> so, so was that how you got into Parliament Funkadelic? I think it, it might have been. <laughs> it it might is. probably is. Well, might have been PC. Oh, there, there was, uh, because it, they always just remind me of, because I know a lot of people have discovered Parliament Funkadelic through Snoop Dogg, and I, I wanted to ask uh, whether you caught sight and um, enjoyed his recent stunt course with everything that you're doing with houseplant and and oh, yeah, all, all the passionate <laughs> education that you've given people about uh, smoking cannabis uh, did you enjoy his whole i'm giving up smoke and then uh, i didn't and catch then the selling... back half of it what did he do after so it was for a smokeless it, it was pit? so it was literally being <laughs> what? <laughs> what? what it really was one of the picture biggest... the most random thing that could have been in support of. <laughs> That, but it was being it covered was by story. kind of I know, saw like he's, he's, BBC he's done, News yeah. um, and, you know, the front page of newspapers. <laughs> he's giving up smoking uh, cannabis. Uh, Snoop's done. And people were wondering. Everybody that I knew was saying. And then it was literally to advertise a smokeless fire pit. It, and he's not giving up. No, he's not giving up. Well, I knew that. So when we have a project that's in trouble, you give up I weed. I have to pretend to, you yeah. pretend to give up weed. It's and the third time. <laughs> nice to know we have that card to play now. Yes. I know, that too definitely... powerful. Yeah, I wonder if we... Yeah, he wishes he spent that on another, on another it product. It seems like yeah. a... I was thinking that the, the, the Smokeless Fire Pit uh, producers, that company, are literally the luckiest company Yeah, ever. they really can't. No one's going to believe that, that again. No, we can't true. believe what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he didn't know it would cause such a stir, but it literally was uh, everywhere. It was uh, everywhere. I do, yeah. I, I actually, I messaged him right away and was like, this can't be true, can it? <laughs> <laughs> Just a smiley face emoji or a wink. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah. really so brilliant. Uh, yeah, so, really so song song two, Seth. Song two, Seth is, and again, it's Tarantino. It is the Delphonics theme by the Delphonics. Ah, <laughs> I, I knew you'd say that one. Philadelphia song all the time. <laughs> and like, first, it, I like that a band has a theme song. Like, <laughs> I just think that's cool. That it they is. were like, "What's this song called?" And they're like, "It's our theme song." <laughs> Which self-titled is, theme song yeah, yeah. it's their self it's called the Delphonics theme which is like <laughs> a cool name for a song when you are the band um, but it's an amazing song and I listen to it all the time it has and an incredible he puts it on all the time and whenever he listens to it at some point he goes oh 
it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Every time. It's, it's very cool. I've always tried to put it in movies. I like have not been able to yet. I like don't know where to or how to. I actually think the first I heard the Delphonics was in Jackie Brown because yeah. they had a yeah. running storyline in Jackie Brown. Um, but uh, was that? Didn't yeah. I change your mind this time? Or? There's a few of them. Yeah, There's yeah. like a running thing where he's. They're both into the Delphonics, like uh, the 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 Bail Bondsman and Jackie Brown. Like both. There's a few Delphonics uh, songs in it, and like. Um, but then I got the rest. Speaking of records, I got like a really old, like original, like Delphonics record um and that had the theme on it and that's where i think the first time i like was playing the song over and over and over and over, over and over, over again but it was like it's like one of my prized possessions was this like delphonics record from the 60s that had uh the delphonics theme on it <laughs> so that's so it's such amazing music uh, yeah. and are you a fan of philadelphia soul music in oh, yes. general things like the stylistics or the spinners oh yeah or... i love all that stuff stylistic spinners and like uh yeah i mean we love i grew up we grew up listening to the roots like we were obsessed with the roots so like i think like mm -hmm. philly music in general like double dutch bus all that kind of stuff like that that's all from <laughs> philly like uh that stuff's awesome though like uh yeah philly music's great yeah well you've uh, you've hit on uh, something close close to my heart because uh uh, Deborah and I recently got married and we had the stylistics uh, really? because we're friends Whoa, uh, with that's them. incredible <laughs> and, that's uh, good wedding music well it was it was good wedding music my my brother's more of a kind of uh, David Guetta type of guy so yeah. he was like, <laughs> when, when's the clubbing part of the evening starting and I was just like well it's not starting it's, <laughs> it's not, not it's, it will but not it's, start. <laughs> it's such fantastic music oh it's the best uh, music, the Philadelphia yeah. it's soul the music best mood you yeah. want to be in a nice mood and I can uh, identify with the, uh, you know, saying, oh, so good every time you put it on. <laughs> it has that dun, 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 dun. I'm always like, yeah. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it gets me. So song free, Evan. Uh, even though I think it maybe is a little cheesy, it's John Lee Hooker, Boom Boom. Uh, I'm Great song. very into the blues, and that's the one that got me into the blues, and so it just has a place in my heart. It is in a Scorsese. I think it's in Casino. I think there's a huge it, yeah, sequence yeah. in Casino set to Boom Boom Boom. I'm pretty sure. But again, it's uh, it's great. What a good song. And we had written it in the super band. I remember oh, when yeah. it was when like me and Bill. There's a part where the cops like arrive at the party, like like we show up to the party that the kids are at and like yeah, I remember yeah, yeah, in the, yeah. and it didn't work it's funny because it just shows how much like changes when someone else is directing it but like in our head it was this like reveal in slow motion <laughs> cops came in and like it was like boom 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 and then in the actual movie like a kid opened the door and bill goes oh shit it's the cops and it's like <laughs> so much funnier <laughs> and such a better laugh but uh yeah we, we were just trying to be cool so did did the tune get taken out when it was not the whole, in the movie. When not the whole in the movie. scene i think i think nothing we wrote is ultimately in the i don't movie. think any of the songs we put in the <laughs> but movie we had a great here. time we did have a good time happened. doing it <laughs> uh, when did you get into the blues uh, I think you played the. I mean, Evan had a guitar. We were in high school. Would play the blues all. I day. can only play the blues. Yeah, I have terrible rhythm. He knows the blues. And I can just chords very well though. Just play a blues scale. That's all I got. I'm a very <laughs> do, bad do you guy. still play? Yeah, every blue moon. My kids ruined every blues Gu moon. Every blues moon. <laughs> guitar. Yeah, and and harmonica, which no one wants to hear when you're not uh, live on stage and yeah. part of a band. So. <laughs> just me alone in my back house playing pretty bad blues. <laughs> and you you've never done it in any kind of you know. Because, I mean, probably if you wanted to, you could. No, I've never. Me and David Krumholtz and Kevin Corrigan and Seth sometimes went and jammed. We would jam. We uh, jammed a little. But uh, that's all. I remember you could have played it one night. Uh, we, we used to hang out at Canner's Deli all the time, and there's they have a, a room called oh, the yeah. Kibbutz Room. We have live <laughs> oh, yeah. music. And Evan and I were at the Kibbutz Room, and he went to the bar and said, Who's performing on Friday? And they said, You want to perform on Friday? <laughs> and he said, No. I said, Who's performing Friday? And they said, Oh, we don't know. But if you want to perform on Friday, you can. <laughs> I should have <laughs> like, done oh, it. Wow, yeah. Easy <laughs> to get a spot at this joint. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, Which I'm explained sure. a lot of the people you would yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. Give it true Give, <laughs> after that. I was like, this adds lesson. up. <laughs> Given the amount of stuff you've done, I'm sure that you would uh, you'd be able to do uh, you know something something musical. But I mean, I guess you've got lit. Yeah, We've so got many different ventures for our musical tastes. In, 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 we get to well, put the vinyl music set. In stuff. Yeah, we make our vinyl. Our movie now. Our movies and TV shows. We make like we we pick a lot of the music for that stuff, and it's very. Which is nice. Yeah. Music's yeah. more affordable in films now and television. Yeah. You can get a lot more stuff. You really can, yeah. What, what when happen? is that is that just because as 
Just records. the music industry collapsed. Has <laughs> yeah, has collapsed. I think they were like, we should sell this song 10 times we instead of one. Shit cheaper. And now yeah. you can clear bands you could never clear before. Yeah. Well, when yeah. we were younger, it was like Led Zeppelin cannot be in any. Yeah, they're like, the Beatles will it never is clear. Beastie theory. Boys will never clear. There were certain bands that. The Beatles was Mad, was Mad Men the first. I think it was in like Tomorrow Never Knows was in a Mad Men episode and people yeah, were like, like freaking out over it. such a weird way for that to yeah. happen. And, and, yeah. Then like, and now yeah. you can like, you could clear like Shake It Up Baby if you like, like you could clear, yeah, like it's all on the table now, which uh, is, is great for movies if you Sense. can afford it. They're very prohibitively expensive a lot <laughs> yeah. of these songs. Because bef- <laughs> before, well, now it's kind of the thing that people in the industry talk about, about being the only way of people making big money from recorded music oh, yeah. Yeah. is sync placements but interesting that even the big bands you know everything's getting less uh, expensive you gotta, if you don't play the sphere you're not making exactly. money <laughs> it's the only way to make dough <laughs> well I saw the the ad on the sphere uh, <laughs> that was just Seth goofing around that was that would have cost a lot of money but instead it cost no money <laughs> oh, okay oh. they sh- it should have been a real thing yeah exactly <laughs> so it was going to be $650,000 I'd be happy to make it real but that's how much an ad for the sphere is <laughs> seriously yeah it's so, really yeah. expensive uh, and have you have you been no not Should yet have, no. we're gonna go we're gonna go at the beginning we're going to that year. sphere oh we're going it to looks. that sphere I will yeah, be in crazy. that sphere. Yeah, and it's weird. Like it's it's U two, and like I wouldn't be clamoring to go see U two like aggressively, but in the sphere, it feels right. Yes, yeah. I was kind of wondering what had happened to them because they were doing the biggest tours, and then they went quiet for a bit, and now yeah, well, clearly this is this is yeah, clearly they what they were they were up to. Way. Don't worry, <laughs> they know what they're doing. We yeah. are doing something. Yeah, uh, it was unbelievable. Yeah, I never saw you ever see U two. You know, it was one of those things where I was like on, and this happens to me a lot. I was like on a random talk show one time, and YouTube was like the guest. So like I saw them like this far YouTube. away from them. Like uh, that, that's happened to me a few times. Which was one time I was on SNL, and like Radiohead was the musical guest, so I got to see like Radiohead rehearse and like like uh, do their sound check and stuff oh like my that. God. Yeah, it was really amazing. Incredible. Oh, man. One time we were walking, uh, we were filming Pineapple Express, and just heard some music. And we went, and it was Stevie Nicks practicing on a stage alone. with Tom Petty, right? It was yeah, like, then yeah. Tom Petty. Came yeah, out. and we were like al- like alone in an empty soundstage with Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty, like like rehearsing yeah, for we a tour. They were going to go songs. on. Yeah, it was, so cool. it was incredible. It was really amazing. Wow. <laughs> yeah, some of the uh, musical exposure to music musicians and uh, yeah. people. Once incredible. I was on Fallon, he was uh, I was on Jimmy Fallon speaking of Stevie Wonder, and he was the musical guest, and he just stayed and played all of songs in the key of life what? like as i sat in a chair like this far away from them and for he played, the whole audience yeah for the entire audience wow. he's just like i'm just gonna keep going and he played the entire album it was insane it was like truly wow. one of the craziest things i've ever seen <laughs> unbelievable yeah it was amazing <laughs> wow. I'm, well i'm very jealous of all of these things. <laughs> so, so what's song free for you sir song three is another one i'm always trying to get in movies sloop john b ah the beach boys that was in super bad in the script, it was in the script, <laughs> but we never we didn't get it in the movie. But yeah, I I love the Beach Boys. I'm uh, somewhat obsessed with the Beach Boys. How how come um, you've not managed to get into a movie yet? Just not been right. It's just hard. I think it's a hard song to clear. I think they were a ba- they were yeah. a band that like it was notoriously hard to clear their music, and I think it's in something. Yeah, I can't I remember something what. Recently. I saw it in something kind of recently too, and I was like. <laughs> but they uh yeah it's there it, 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 it was like hard music to clear you know um it's funny music like there's a a, a super bad song clearance story is um there's a scene in super bad where me and bill Hader and and uh, christmas plus mclovin are like spinning donuts in like the parking lot in a police car and as we were shooting the scene there's no music playing like it's just a shooting, you know, the the direction was like, be raucous and have fun. And we spin the car, and when it stops, Bill just goes, Panama, as though we are listening to Panama. But we weren't listening to Panama. And then we want, and then we kept watching it in the movie, and then we played Panama over it, and it like synced up perfectly. But the problem was that Van Halen had like never cleared, they were like in a fight, and they like hadn't cleared a song in like 15 years. They couldn't years get them movie. to like sign Because they literally the couldn't they get, get them to like agree on a thing. And then 
and it was also unaffordable, so we had to put it in the trailer. Well, and then it made a it, perfect trailer. Yeah, and then what happened is like they cleared the song, and it became the song in the trailer <laughs> for Superbad. Like, and it all was based on Bill just improvising, going Panama, like in the parking lot, and the whole it like brought Van Halen back together to clear a song for the movie, <laughs> and then became the song that was like the entire marketing campaign for the movie. It was so weird. <laughs> it had a lot of musical miracles on that. Yeah, show. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. I think the Beach Boys. That might be the Sleep John B, yeah. um, and and you know not being able to actually get them to agree. That could be the reason. It could be that because they're yeah. kind of two bands now. Like yes. Brian Wilson. Um, I think he has all the rights to all of it though. Because yeah, he wrote it yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then I Mike think. Love actually has the name. I think is that. Yes, I think he tours as the Beach Boys and but, Brian Wilson. Is I think he tours as Mike Love's Beach Boys. <laughs> No, I think he, he literally has the name, but I think a lot of people just go and see Brian Wilson because a lot of people don't like Mike Love and yeah. that's the basic vibe. But once they got back together for the, uh, I think, 50-year anniversary, um, and that was, um, yeah, we went to see when they were on stage together. Oh, that's amazing. I don't know why they didn't just continue, but, I mean, obviously they, they can't get on. They yeah, well, really each other. It could be that. It could be that. <laughs> Yeah, it's you always gotta, what I assume. You gotta yeah. really hate someone to not want to play good vibrations. With you. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of animosity. You're like, no, <laughs> I will not. <laughs> with with the person who wrote it as well. Yeah, uh, that movie about Brian Wilson's pretty good. The one with Paul Dano and uh, John good. Cusack. Yeah, I, I like. I think that movie has good. the song in it actually. Also, Love and Mercy. Yeah, Love and yeah, Mercy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that movie. Yeah, and a, a really good song as well, like really a solo song. record. That he, yeah, um, really, yeah. really good song. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. And so you, you talking about that trailer um, just reminded me of um, what I was reading um, about This Is The End and the uh, YouTube trailer. And it said, said online that you, that you made this the YouTube short first Yes, uh, as, as a way of kind of getting interest and funding and so that just spoke of a very kind of entrepreneurial uh, mindset that both of you have do you consider yourselves i mean or have you always from day one wanted to be kind of business people and uh, and and been looking at it from that side as well as you know the writing and and, and, and comedy and, and have you always been felt like you're switched on from that kind of business standpoint uh well we actually did it was a short film we did with our friend jason stone and it was uh purely like for fun we didn't have like a, mer a mercurial <laughs> plan with it yeah um and we just wanted to be writers and we wanted to make stuff and then we quickly realized we needed to like become producers and get involved in the business or all of our stuff would get ruined. Yes. It, uh, it was. And then we got very interested in the business because we just knew, like, this is what we have to do to make the movies and TV shows we want to make. Yeah. It was purely born out of, like, a desire to protect our, like, creative desires and visions, you know? Like, it was never... Oh, it wouldn't it be fun to have a company and like go <laughs> yeah, on pitch yeah. meetings all day and, and like <laughs> and like have all these people that work for us and like that and was it, not it, a part of it. It's worth it and it's fun, but it's uh, yeah. It was all like of necessity. Yeah and, yeah, and and it was us working with other producers who we saw like oh because they have power they're able to protect their movies and 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 honestly it's mostly the market like it it, it it largely came out of a desire to be very involved in the marketing of our work yeah, we would work on something for six years and then people would have it for two months and it's fake and it's they chosen. control like fully how the world ingest mm. that thing like at face value you know and and all the your introduction to it is dictated by like a marketing department and if you and how the average person yeah is like interacting with it for the first time is all through marketing and if you have no control over that it can be devastating you know and it can yeah. take a thing that you love and you look at the marketing and you're like i don't even like like i i, I wouldn't even go see this you know and so <laughs> that was something that yeah, like it, again, it was it was purely born out of like a desire to protect ourselves. Um, was that the know. main way in which things changed? Because obviously, you'd been collaborating and working on projects um, uh, w way before you founded, um, you know, Point Grey. Yeah. Um, so was was that the main way in which things changed once it became a kind of an official company and 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 and, and you grew it that way? Just you know, retaining more control over the marketing of things and. Well, yeah, well, and then it kind of grew into like us being able to decide what we want to make, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we started with the movie Fifty Fifty. That was just a movie that our friend wrote, and again, it was kind of just born out of necessity. Like, it didn't 
seem like other producers we knew would want to make it. Judd, who he worked with a lot, was making funny people, which was kind of similar in some ways and had similar themes of like illness and mortality. And so we were like, I guess we should just produce it ourselves. And then it went really well. And then we, uh, yeah, started to see like, oh, we can, we can, we can kind of bring other people's visions to lives. We can take things that we love and we don't have to be the ones to write them and direct them. We can, we can help facilitate other people writing them and directing them, things like that. Um, that movie also had some musical miracles. We got Michael Giacchino to do the score, which was insane. Yeah. And, uh, and it was the only time we ever put our own money directly into something just so we could end it with yellow lead better. Yeah. And that was like a last minute thing where, yeah, the studio, uh, they were called summit entertainment would not pay, uh, for the song we needed for the end of the movie. And so we paid our own money to use the, to do the song. But Eddie Vedder was on his honeymoon. And we needed him to clear the song that <laughs> week, literally, or uh, it wouldn't be, like be able to be legally cleared for the film. And someone contacted him on his honeymoon and like had him clear the movie for his honeymoon. A funny thing that uh, on his honeymoon, a funny thing that's happened a few times though, also is like in this is the end. We did a thing with War Pigs where we kind of like took that like and like we kind of repurposed it into score like it happens in the song a few times dun, 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 and we wanted to like whoops we wanted to extend it and use it as like score for like a whole montage basically and in order to do it we had to sh screen the movie for Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> so he could sign off on what we were doing the war pigs uh, and it was a similar uh, thing with the Green <laughs> Hornet where we took the White Stripes song and oh, it yeah, transitioned yeah, yeah. into score and we had to screen the whole movie for Jack White and it's like so nerve wracking because also like they're watching the whole movie to approve like 45 seconds of thing that's in the actual And movie. we're just watching them watching Yeah, them. and you're literally standing in the back of the theater just being like, oh my God, just please let them Did they enjoy it? This. Yeah, they both cleared it ultimately. They didn't, yeah, we yeah, wouldn't yeah. have. <laughs> yeah, that's I remember Ozzy loved it. <laughs> that must have been, yeah, nerve-wracking, but... No, I actually remember Ozzy cool. loved it and he, and he was like, I'll clear it if you play another Black Sabbath song after the... Yeah, it's like the second the song, song in the yeah. end credits. So yeah, there's like, there's two end credits song and the second one's like another Sabbath song because he, he wanted two of them. <laughs> that. I am too. It's it a cool song. Like a kind yeah. of badass way. Yeah. That's yeah, so awesome. So um, weird. <laughs> and, and it shows that you, you know, you really do have a, a passion for music if you're willing to go that extra mile, you know, put your own money into clearing a, a song, co you know, contacting someone on their honeymoon. I mean, it's Oh uh, yeah, I can't believe he responded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've still never met him in person, but I will thank him when I do. <laughs> <laughs> and and so uh what's song for Evan? Uh, I have to say a funny song at some point, I think, uh, and that is Tenacious D Double Team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I legit think that the, the first Tenacious D album is unbelievable. It's such good music, and it's so funny. And I just every time I listen to that song, I laugh. It never fails. It's it's and great, and it's ridiculous, songs. and and I love it. Yeah, I mean, it felt, it still holds up. I mean, we're talking about movies and whatever, the things that hold up. And that's something that, you know, so many people grew up with the, that first record. And it's, it was, yeah, it was actually unbelievable. It was groundbreaking. Yeah, and I remember I was at university and Seth came and he was like, I have this thing. It's called Tenacious D. Yeah. We're going to sit and listen to it straight through. And I, I, like, I knew, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm sure we are. Totally. I, remember, I, I knew Jack Black a little bit. And I, um, I remember literally like he, he, I was writing a pilot, me, Jason Siegel, uh, were writing a pilot with Jack Black in 1999, maybe, or 2000, 2001, around then, right before the Tenacious D album came out. And I remember like literally like Jack, like sit, I was like sitting in his car as he like put in the CD and he was like, listen to this. Like, we, like he's like, we made a real album. And he's like, that's Dave Grohl playing. It's real. Like, <laughs> like that's, he's like, he's like, that's like real. And like, I couldn't believe it. And then I got the CD. Yeah. And all of my friends were in college. I, oh. and I brought it and it was like, listen, behold, yeah, like was, I bring, I bring comedy from America. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And I, we were obsessed with Tenacious And it'd been yeah. like, we love Weird Al. And it had been a long time since Weird Al had been, you know, we were in university. It wasn't the Weird Al time. I hadn't heard a funny album in so long. And it just became one of those like college things that everyone was obsessed with. And it was nonstop. Yeah. 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 Well, well, before, before that it was Weird Al and it was something that hadn't really crossed into where it was, you know, in the charts. And the, I mean, I think I saw them at Reading Festival, literally. I've never, I've never seen them. It was, it was, I think they're, they're going back on the road. Good. Yeah. It's a, it's a good, 
it's a good thing that they're still doing yeah, it because it awesome. could have just turned into like a cult. They keep rocking. It's because yeah. they're legitimately awesome. Like they're, it's not they're a proper joke. musicians. Like, yes. They're they're incre- like Jack's a incredible singer and Kyle like, yeah. and they harmonize so well together and they play so well together like it's not a joke like they they, they the joke wouldn't work if it wasn't the joke wouldn't if work the music it was wasn't good, good. Yeah, like, that's the joke I so still remember good. like like few what's I remember High Fidelity came out I can't I don't know what 1998 or some shit like that maybe uh, you know um, we were I, we didn't have Tenacious D had an HBO show, and that's how most people knew Tenacious D and Jack Black. And we didn't have that in Canada. And so High Fidelity came out, and the whole joke in High Fidelity that was the first time I'd seen Jack in anything. And the joke is he's in a band, and you think his band sucks. And then at the end of the movie, he gets up and sings Let's Get It On, and you see Jack Black for the first time and how incredible he is. And I remember, like, it couldn't have worked on me more. Like, like, <laughs> Like the whole movie, I was like, oh, like this dumb buffoon and his stupid band, like this guy's gonna fucking suck. Like, that's the joke. And then he sings, and I rem- and the whole theater, I remember it was like a revelation. And you were just like, who is this guy? Like, he he was so funny and then so talented. And like it, it, it really like I to this day, I like I'm in that Mario Brothers movie with him, that Peaches that song Peaches he did. Song, man. It's just like he is so funny and so talented, and someone who is like not in my opinion fallen off like one inch like he's mm. he's so fucking good and in those jumanji he's like so much funnier in those jumanji <laughs> movies than he needs to be and then like then like he's so good in those movies he's got a great joke <laughs> uh, and school of rock uh, oh yeah I don't know. so good it was, it was like a definitive I just Music watched it with my so friend's like eleven year old. Like uh, yeah, my my friend still like I, my friend's like eleven year old daughter watched it for the first time. Like we showed it to her, and she just like loved it. And you could just see like she's like, oh my god, Jack Black's amazing. <laughs> and it's that uh, the whole uh, scene of you know rock history and appreciation. Yeah, I remember just trying to spot every last band oh, yeah. that he wrote down because he <laughs> just so many good ones. Stuff. Um, yeah, what and it it works because as you say of, of of his yeah. talent he's amazing yeah so good that movie's so good few movies in the history of movies i would argue have like married like music story and... plot and talent <laughs> yeah. into like that's a movie that like it could not be anyone other than jack black yeah like it, there it, is it, a touring musical and it's good yeah it's <laughs> but it's they're just good. doing jack black <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're doing pretty good jack black they do a pretty yeah. good jack black <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he created created that that whole timeless yeah. thing, and it's it's very it's rare to see um, like a comedy and music being combined so well in the, in that way. Yeah. Um, what's what song for for you, sir? Well, I wanted to pick a Wu Tang song because I love Wu Tang, and so the question was, what Wu Tang song? And my personal favorite Wu Tang song Ooh. is "Reunited," which is uh, on the double L, the first song on Wu Tang Forever. Uh, it's an amazing song. It has that violin. Uh, it's Wu motherfuckers. <laughs> Wu Tang motherfuckers. It's just so good. I love Wu Tang so much. I remember getting that double album when it came out, um, and it was incredible. And then that double album is the album that notoriously lost the Grammys that caused uh, Old Dirty Bastard to storm the stage and scream, Wu Tang is for the children. <laughs> what, what, what happened there? Wu Tang lost the Grammy for best hip hop album, I think, to like Puff Daddy or something like that. Yeah. No, hasn't aged well, um, and, <laughs> uh, and 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 old dirty bastard. They all dressed to me like I remember because I was a Wu Tang fan, and they all showed up wearing like three piece suits and like fur coats and like fur hats with like canes and like they just couldn't have been cooler and then they lost and old dirty bastard stormed the stage with the microphone, took the microphone and started screaming, "Wu Tang is for the children." <laughs> Wu Tang is for the children, <laughs> and the line "Wu Tang is for the children" has like been you know tattooed on my brain ever since then. But uh, yeah, that's that's what happened. I then. think there's yeah, is there a doc? Have you seen there's a Wu Tang documentary that people there's have been raving about? I'm in one of them. <laughs> what's, what's that one called? I think that was on, on Showtime a while ago. There's a few Wu Tang documentaries. You're in a Wu Tang. I was like a talking head in like a Wu Tang documentary. Hey, you're in it there. Yeah. Sick. Um, I love Wu Tang. I've worked with RZA's and funny people. I've acted. We, I, he was lovely. He was amazing. He was playing weird. chess a lot. 
He played chess. I was at the last ever Wu Tang show that had every member of the Wu Tang Clan at it as well, which to me was a big. When when was that? I think it was in 2004, maybe? It was at a thing called Rock the Bells. Here's the thing. Yeah. I love Wu-Tang. They do not put on the best show. This was a really good show. I heard they have a I, Vegas really? residency that they're uh, starting, which Ooh. would be amazing. Yeah, which I bet will be It really just kind of descends into madness at the end of a lot of their shows. There's too it's many strong. Sometimes there's too many people on so stage. Sometimes you're just like, there's 400 people on this stage. <laughs> like, you lose right. track of who's It's hard to discern band. what's happening a little bit. Yeah. What, what, what happened I was at one Wu-Tang show, and there was more people on the stage than in the audience. <laughs> uh, yeah, it just, it, it's a lot. Yeah, it, it kind of, but this one was good. Like, I feel like they knew because they, it would also the first one they had all been at in a long time. So it was, it, I think it like, they didn't know it was going to be the last one, but they, there was a sense that there was something like we should, we should keep this tight. We We're all this actually yeah, here. We could all actually do our parts. Cause I also think often not all of them are there. And so they're making up for that and, and rapping That's over true. other people's shit. So like, I think when they're all there, it, it yeah, it seemed, it seemed to fire in all cylinders. Did, did they do a kind of, was it them who did the NFT record oh, the, the or single, something? Uh, single no, copy. they had a physical, actual, they had a physical album yeah. that they sold for millions of dollars. Basically. Yeah. Um, that they made one of, yeah. They made Which one of. Which is the of. coolest move. But, and a funny thing in the album is one of the stipulations contractually when you bought it was it's yours unless Bill Murray steals it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder when, it's, when is the shoe going to drop? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like Bill Murray was given legal rights to to heist the album. You imagine how satisfying it would be to see that in the paper. <laughs> Bill Murray fulfills contractual rights. Exactly. To, to steal the album. <laughs> who 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 was who bought it? That pharma bro, Martin Scraley, the terrible man. Oh, that yeah. guy. <laughs> the guy who was like a piece of shit, like like up charging like. Well, then I hope Bill steals it. Well, he's in jail. I think he went to... I actually think he went to jail. So, like, the state of New York might own that album now. (laughs) All right. Well, maybe there's hope for it to be released. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, what's uh, your final song, Song 5? It is also a Wu-Tang song. Ooh. Ah. It is Gravel Pit. Oh, check out my gravel pit. I like gravel pit. <laughs> a mystery unraveling. Wu Tang is up. the city it's that exciting. I travel in. They had like a Flintstones themed music video that I thought was fantastic. Holocaust from the land of the lost. Behold the pale horse. Hardcore. <laughs> yeah. It's a good. The word. The, the song starts with the word Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what you're doing. <laughs> Opening word. <laughs> Holocaust. <laughs> It might be check out my gravel. Technically, check out my gravel pit is the first line of the song. But yeah, if you want to get into the they get the Holocaust pretty fast. Holocaust. <laughs> it's still a good song. Shows it, and in that in the video, old dirty bastard couldn't be there. He was in jail, and so there's like a guy <laughs> in like a Flintstones prison that you don't see his face like rapping through the bars. They, they, they incorporated it artfully and uh, figured out a song. That is a great song. I do love gravel. When pit. when you said that you went to say or. You know, they weren't that good live and stuff. Like, how many times have you been to see them? Uh, I've seen iterations probably, I don't know, 12 times. I've seen yeah. the oh whole Oh, my band. God. Wow. Well, because we would go to, like, a Ghostface Kill and Raekwon show, and some of them would be there. we go to RZA show, and some of them would be For there. we go to Method Man show, and some of them would be there. Yeah, Method Man. Yeah, I, I've Maybe been to a lot more. of Ghostface and Method Man. Yeah, I think they did tour more, but... Uh... Yeah, I, I think we would go for a while. Like our friend David Krumholtz. Uh, he was he he was he's obsessed, obsessed with Wu Tang. He has he has a, a gargantuan Wu Tang tattoo <laughs> on his arm. Which is the least surprising thing. Yeah, ever. it's like <laughs> it is truly humongous. <laughs> are they are they one of the groups that you've kind of bonded the most over? They're, like pretty, they're pretty up there. We really like the Wu Tang Clan. We were always like super, super, super into them, and like um, our, our our LA group of friends like truly loved them. Everyone, so it was like a nice. It was also like there. they were popular in our high school. Like, I, I, like in our high school, like I feel like like Jay Z and like Biggie and those like weren't as popular as like Wu Tang and Tribe Called Quest. Yeah, all the those, East Coast yeah. Americans seem to have gotten a lot more of that. But yeah, way yeah, up in Vancouver. Yeah, we got Wu Tang. Yeah, we got Wu Tang and Tribe. We got like a lot of that. And Cypress Hill. And Cypress Hill. We were obsessed with Cypress Hill, which leads me to my final pick. (laughs) (laughs) We've come full circle. (laughs) They played right before Wu-Tang at Rock the Bells. It's a good one. So what Cypress Hill? 
I'm going to go hits from the bong by saying for sale. <laughs> Not bad. Very appropriate. Because it has son of a, I mean, it has the son of a preacher man hook, yeah. which again, back to Pulp Fiction, mm-hmm. it all comes back together. <laughs> Tarantino, son of a preacher man. First time I heard the song. I probably heard the hits from the bong before I saw Pulp Fiction, maybe around that. But there's a world where that was all happening around the same time. But what's funny is like, we, you know, we made Pineapple Express, we made Wee Movies, we have House Plant, and like, if I had to like, identify like the first group of people who were like like really making like like weed music that was landing with me very like Snoop Dogg was rapping about weed but he was also rapping about other stuff Cypress Hill was only rapping about they committed like their whole (laughs) thing was weed and they were and and it like really like landed with me and was really like like affirming in some ways that like a group was like so popular, so good, so well produced. Their art was awesome. Their videos were cool. The the, the songs themselves were great. Like, and it was all about weed. And as and someone so who, unabashed, yeah, so unabashed. And I think like yeah, the song was called "Hits from the Bong." It's like literally just about smoking weed. And like that was also it, a funny thing with parents back then, where it's just like you're listening to "Hits from the Bong." They know what's going. They know what's happening. Yeah, <laughs> but it really like was in, was encouraging in a lot of ways, and like made us feel not like. Like, it made us feel like better about ourselves and our habits and our choices because you were like, if Cypress Hill's rapping about it, how bad could it be? Those guys are great. They were in The Simpsons. They got that great joke. Yes, they the were orchestra. kind of the, the first like giant mainstream thing. They were like, in my opinion, yeah, the it. first like mainstream thing that was all about weed. That was like unabashed. Like, again, yeah, like, like Snoop, he, when he first came out, weed was a part of it, but it was like Gin and Juice was his song, not Hits from the Ball. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, like they were just like. Yeah, with Cypress Hill, it was the exception when it wasn't about weed. Yeah, it was almost Every always about weed. Yeah. Snoop's kind of happened over time. Yeah, he got like, Where there. people yeah. really, above all else, associate with him smoking. Yeah. Cypress Hill, have that song. Cypress Hill have a song yeah, called yeah. I Want to Get High. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's good. I yeah. want to get high. <laughs> so high. That's the hook. <laughs> the hook is I want to get high so high. That is some, <laughs> it's some of the best hip hop music ever made. Some all, all Those bands that you're talking about uh, from the 90s, those groups. Um, oh, yeah. They're so well, good. They started in the 90s, rather. Yeah. Um, and, and so in, in terms of Houseplant, because, you know, a lot of people are going to check out or, I mean, obviously, this is a you know a huge uh, global um, uh, brand that you've created. Why did you create it, and what kind of? Because I I read that you were trying to dispel uh, certain myths about um, or preconceptions people might have about smoking weed. Um, what 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 were those, and and why were you kind of so passionate to to start House Plant because of that? I mean, it kind of started mostly with like, what do we want? Yeah, like, what do we actually just want in our homes? And then it kind of led to conversations about how people have like their bar set up, even if they don't drink much, but they don't have a weed set up and it's kind of under the desk, you know, on the shelf. It's stigmatized, so yeah. Um, we yeah. wanted to bring it forward. Yeah, exactly. Put it on your coffee table. Yeah, and I, it was the yeah. like with our movies, the thought was always like, what movies that don't exist yet do we want to see? And those would be the movies we would make. And with this, it was. Yeah, like as people who love weed and have grown up smoking weed and have always been associated with weed and have seen that when we make things that have to do with weed, they really land with people, especially other people who love weed, you know. Um, And yeah, we had done it with movies and, and TV here and there. But like the idea of actually making like the things we wanted that went along with weed, like that were unabashedly nice and that were like escalating weed and 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 putting it on a pedestal and and like revering it you know and and that was something that like we're so used to just like hiding our weed and yeah like you're you're like ashing in a mug and and like you you know you 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 don't like display it proudly and 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 so this idea of like making things for people who smoke weed that that you can display and that speak to you and, and speak to your sensibilities and when people come over they see it and they understand who you are and what you like to do like i think all that was 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 what was going on in our heads as we were talking about it you know yeah it's truly ridiculous that weed is illegal at all and it's it's silly it's regressive it speaks to illogical thinking it is not acknowledging reality in any way shape or form and it is like a falsehood that has been allowed to prevail like for so long and and it's 
and in America, it's like, you know, it's like there's major cultural like repercussions as a result of it, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, like anything that can be done to show people that like weed is not bad. It's actually like works very well into most people's lives. And, and it's especially far less harmful than things like alcohol, you know? And so like to us, like as long as alcohol is more readily available than weed in any way, shape or form, like people are not acknowledging reality simply put, which is, which is. Yeah. And, and we're getting closer, but they still sell weed and like these childproof things. And you can just open the top of a whiskey bottle easily. Like, yeah. And the thing is like, yes, not yeah, and, and it's like if a kid yeah. drinks a bottle of whiskey, it's actually harmful, but like it, like it's different with like <laughs> just to be clear we're not saying give kids weed yeah, but unless your kid can roll a joint you, you don't got a problem <laughs> and it's, it is just strange how certain things were given this sort of acceptability smoking yeah. tobacco for example yeah uh, did I, I stole your fifth song I didn't did you say your fifth song I said mine but you did mine was gravel oh yeah there you go okay good <laughs> you both had your fifth song right yeah I did we both did okay yeah. I wanted to make sure I thought I'm I very sorry if no, I no, no 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 I thought I, I thought okay, okay. I, I, I want yeah I wanted to finish by asking you because uh, obviously a lot of people will have grown up on you know, movies TV big houseplant customers um, but something that's really interesting is that you have been friends since you were young now you're like business partners um, writing together um, what is the key uh, to staying mates, staying friendly <laughs> when you're working together, writing together? Uh, uh, you've got like this whole other kind of brand together. You just have to like the same music. That's all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the only thing that matters. As long as two of your five favorite songs are by Wu Tang, then you're. <laughs> well, we, we just started doing. We were friends at a very young age, and we were business partners at a very young age. So we kind of just got through like like as we were becoming adults, we kind of got through everything. We had like our highs and lows well before we even like were 20. Yeah, We've before just, the stakes were that high, which is nice as well. Yeah, our 30th anniversary of working together is coming up. Yeah, wow. that's pretty crazy, actually. It's pretty crazy. That is insane. And we talked, you may have been too drunk, but we talked about having a 30th anniversary party. Oh, wait, I do remember yeah, that. Yeah, now. yeah, I was for sure too drunk <laughs> until you just said that. It was but now, Halloween party. We now I remember. It. Yeah, we should do that. <laughs> that's such a funny idea. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it, 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 we. Yeah, it's nice. It's not lost on us, you know. Like mm. we definitely know a lot of teams who've broken up over the years, and so it's 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 nice that we that that happens. When, when the stakes you know? are that, I mean, each one of these projects, whatever you want to call them, like movies involving you know hundreds or I don't know thousands of people, I don't you, you know people who are consumers who are uh, podcast hosts or whatever, uh, don't understand. It's difficult to get your head around each one of these things that we just when I'm researching these interviews, consuming a list, this was a whole huge undertaking that a friendship could fall out, you know, you could fall out over one of these things. So it is... You will never fall out. <laughs> I look, are, you I, to, are you trying to shake it up right now? I am trying. <laughs> you seem no, like you're not going to have an argument no matter how hard I try. <laughs> well, I'm very, I'm very glad to hear, to hear shatter that. Shatter at any moment. <laughs> still make playlists. That's yeah. not true. No, we don't. Not, unless it's for a movie or houseplant. We have, though, yeah. Well, people should be uh, checking out your uh, houseplant vinyl volume three, um, and there will be links to this in the show notes. But thank you very much thank you. Uh, for coming on the podcast. Thanks, I really, really appreciate thank it. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that podcast with Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogen. I wanted to finish off by recommending the computer game Shadows Over Loathing to you. This is a slapstick figure comedy adventure RPG full of mobsters, monsters, and mysteries. Your Uncle Murray has requested your aid at his antique shop in Ocean City, but upon your arrival, the old man is nowhere to be found. Your investigation into his disappearance and the artifacts he's been collecting takes a turn when you stumble across some shadowy plots and a bunch of squirming eldritch tentacles that threaten to bring about the end of the world. Explore a sprawling, open world chock full of danger, quests, puzzles and stick figures in this single-player comedy adventure RPG set in the Prohibition era of the Loathing Universe. See how many enemies you can stuff into a phone booth as the athletic pig skinner, control the curds and way of the cosmos as the cunning cheese wizard, or march to the beat of your own inscrutable purposes as the hip jazz agent. Shadows Over Loathing is a brilliant game made by our friends at Asymmetric, 
who of course made Kingdom of Loathing and West of Loathing before it. I could not recommend this more highly.